This is an oral history recording with Chuck Warner. Uh, I'm Kathy Hirsch, the interviewer. Uh, and today is Monday, January 23rd, 2023. Uh, the interview is being recorded at the Conrad Center of the West Volusia Historical Society in a joint project with Deland Pride. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, agreeing to be interviewed. And uh, I'd like to start with, um, we're going to go way back into your childhood. Where were you born and where did you live as a child? Well, it's interesting. And people, I thought you were going to ask me what my name was. And, you know, I was uh, born in, in Ann Arbor, go blue, in uh, 1940. But, and my parents named me Gary Lee Rumsey. But then for whatever reason, they gave me up for adoption. So six months later, I was adopted and my new parents named me Charles Edward Werner. My dad's first name was Otto. And they were gonna give me Otto for a middle, middle name. And that would have meant my initials is C-O-W. So they changed it. I'm thankful forever for that. But growing up, I always remember I was a little Chucky, mostly because most of my aunts and uncles were big people, and so I was little Chucky. And then when I got to school, I was Charles because that was proper. Even my mother called me Charles when I did something wrong. And then when I got to high school again, I became, became Chuck. But then uh, later on, I, when I went to work for the cruise line, I was uh, Captain Chuck for a number of years. The owner of the cruise line from Miami Beach uh, playfully named me Skipper Chuck because Chuck Zink was uh, one of the weather forecasters in Miami and he had a cartoon program uh, and kids and his character was Skipper Chuck. So that became that. Then after I worked for the cruise line, I went to work for the circus, and my first two years on the circus, it seemed I was always being involved with a, uh, a promotion with uh, Chuck E. Cheese restaurants. So that became the newest uh, nickname was Chuck E. Cheese. And then uh, several years ago, one of my friends, well, 11 years ago, said, you know, you were adopted. You don't know anything about your medical history. That's important today. You should look and see if you don't have any relatives. So I did, and lo and behold, I have a sister that lives in Maryland, and she has three boys and a middle son, and now lives with me. He's lived with me for 11 years. He introduces to me everyone as Uncle Chuck. So I've gone from Charles to Chucky to uh, Captain Chuck to Skipper Chuck to Chuck E. Cheese and now Uncle Chuck. So depending on who you talk to in Miami people, I mean in Deland, I'm either Chuck or I'm Uncle Chuck. <laughs> A lot of people call me that. So you're in touch then with your biological family? Uh, they've all passed away. And no, I just from the adoption uh, records, I knew what my name was originally. They were music students at the University of Michigan. That's about all I know. What are some of your memories growing up? It was cold. It was it's Michigan. Nice. It was Michigan. Yeah, it was. It was was cold. But the summers were beautiful. Uh, I spent three summers up at Interlochen at National Music Camp. That was always something to look forward to and get to meet people from all around. And it was interesting to me in looking back because the community I lived in, Dearborn, uh, the mayor's political slogan was keep Dearborn clean. And what he really meant, I'm finding out now, was keep Dearborn white. And so I didn't really, until I went to college, uh, I didn't really have a chance to associate or see a whole lot of black people. But then when I went to Wayne State, uh, right in downtown Detroit, why you get to meet people and associate with with black people. And uh, so you learn pretty quick that everybody's black, everybody's white. It's just where they are on the spectrum in between. And they say one day 
there will be one color and it will be yeah mulatto or well, mixed or... and it's the same like like gay or not gay it's on a spectrum i think there are a lot of people that are a little this way or a little that way or a whole lot this way or that way it's the same like being political being conservative or being liberal or somewhere in between i think there's more people that would look at themselves as in between and when did you figure out that you were on that spectrum somewhere? I think when I was in high school, I figured that out, that this is what I, what I preferred. And that couldn't have been easy in those days. No, it wasn't, because you better not tell your parents. You can tell yourself, or maybe you have one or two friends that are like-minded, but it wasn't something you discussed in the 40s or early 50s. Oh, no. And you managed to live with that? Yeah, well, as, as best I could, yeah. Um, when did you, um, when did you come to the land? I came here in 1984. What brought you here? The circus. I was working for the cruise line. The owner of the cruise line was getting ready to turn his business over to his six kids. Nice kids. Hey, Rose, are the checks ready yet? That was the level of interest. And the ships started deteriorating. I didn't have the right last name, so I didn't see any future for me. And so some one of my friends, because I'd liked circuses forever, said, go talk to Renee up in Deland. She's always looking for marketing people. So I made an appointment. I came up. I talked to her. She offered me a job. I went back to the cruise line. I gave them a two weeks notice. And uh, after being for 14 plus years at the uh, cruise line, I started at the circus. A month after working at the circus, I was taking home 50% more money a week than I was with the, with the cruise line. So the circus was very popular, I gather. It was popular, it was profitable, and uh, I enjoyed it. it. You have to get used to the idea that you're changing your zip code every, because I was the marketing director, so one of them, so I was in town for maybe 10 days to two weeks before the circus got there. And uh, so I would be in town longer than the performers, they'd come in the... But then you traveled with the circus? No, I traveled ahead of the circus, and I would be in town, and then when the circus performed here, I would leave, and we had five or six of us, and we were sort of leapfrogging ahead of each other. But then I was handling our engagements in New York City every summer, so I'd be there for nine, ten weeks. Uh, we were sponsored by the Parks Department, and we would be in three or four of the city of New York parks. So I'd be there for an extended stay, which was, was nice. You'd go into town on Wednesday afternoon, take advantage of the half price show tickets, or go to see concerts and things at Central Park and uh, do some of the things that people who live in New York just never do unless they have company. I'd go to the Statue of Liberty, go see the Empire State Building, and do things like that. So the circus was based in Deland in the winter? It, based in Deland, yeah, we had a, a small office, and then we had the winter quarters over across from the Amtrak station. Uh, used to be Johnny Jones Exposition's winter quarters years ago during the uh, uh, first, Second World War. It was a glider factory. They made airplanes there. And uh, then it belonged to Florida State University. I don't know how they acquired it. It was donated to them, I believe. And then uh, the present owner bought it from them. So how many years did you work for the circus? Until I was there from 1984 until about 2013, 2012. So the circus operated until then? Oh, yeah. And then, what's the status now? Kaput. It's, it's uh, 
for a number of reasons, it, it, it wasn't profitable anymore. A lot of the animal rights people would write hate letters to all the malls. How dare you have a show with animals? And yet we did surveys when we were in New York. We had, did one season without animals. People came to where we'd always been in New York. What animals do you have this year? Oh, we don't have any this year. Oh, well, maybe we'll see you next year when we have animals back. And they left people. We did a number of surveys, people to bring their family and kids to the circus to see clowns and animals. Sure. I mean, P.T. Barnum said years ago, clowns and elephants are the pegs that you hang a circus tent on. And what was the name of the circus? Clyde Beatty Coal Brothers. How well known was it? Well, for a long time, Clyde Beatty was probably the foremost animal trainer in, in America, certainly maybe the world. And he had done a number of movies and things. So, so his name was well known. Cole Brothers had been around since 1884. And so having the two together, it was a formidable show. And then Ringling Brothers, of course, they stopped using the tent in 1956. Cole Brothers carried on that tradition and people figured out pretty soon that, gee, do we want to pay $25 to park and go sit in a building a quarter mile away from something? Or do we want to park for free on the grounds of the fairgrounds or at the mall and go sit where we're 50 feet away from something? So there were, sh in the winter time when, it, when the circus wintered here, did they have shows? Not as such, although I remember one year we took the elephants and some of the other people down for the uh, halftime at the uh, Orange Bowl, and they'd find some other things to do. For some years, the show actually did put together a small winter tour and did South Florida, mostly Miami, Miami Beach and, and that area. But a lot of the performers were contracted for the year, so they wanted a vacation too, so they'd go back home to Mexico or Russia or wherever home happened to be, but the animals were all here, the trucks were here, so it was time to take the trucks down to individual pieces, clean them and reassemble them, paint the trucks and renew all the equipment. Although the owners of the show were convinced that if you're paying $20 to see the show in uh, September or October, it should look as nice as if you paid $20 in March or April, and so everything was kind of ongoing to What take kind of care impact of did the circus have in terms of um, local business? You well, mentioned a painting company. Yeah, well, the, the company that sells paint here, uh, when the circus left, it was like their annuity just dried up, and the same with the auto parts, but when we had, we were traveling on 70 vehicles trucks, tractor trailers, individual house trailers and such. And so there was was quite a bit of that. And of course, all these people buy groceries. So having an extra 200 people in your community buying groceries every week for several months in the winter makes a big impact. Was the circus uh, um, something that Delandites were proud of oh, having yeah. here? Oh yeah. Uh, when they have their annual Christmas parade here, it's always a big event. For years and years, the end of the Christmas parade was instead of Santa Claus with reindeer, there were three elephants with Santa Claus uh, to close out the, uh, the parade every year. And uh, they sh people, they showed up. They, we would get a lot of people would show up, school groups and everything else to watch the tent go for the first time every spring because it was history. And particularly older people, uh, we used to attract, surprisingly, it's for kids of all ages, particularly the older age ones, because they remember the circus. They remember growing up in a community that maybe closed school down so everybody could go to the circus. It was that kind of a special thing like Fourth of July or some other holidays, it was, it was special. 
I uh, recall some people we've interviewed mentioning the elephants in the Christmas parade. So yeah. That made quite an impact. We would get school groups. I regularly run into people here who say, oh yeah, we used to go out and we'd hear the lions and the tigers roaring in the morning or at night. And we, our school would have a field trip and we'd go out and see all of the, all the animals. And yeah, it was part of the community. And there are people who maybe didn't come to the circus for whatever reason, but they knew where the circus was and uh, they supported it. Where exactly, what grounds? Is it the fairground that nowadays is the fairground? Or? No, it's, it was actually on uh, Highway 92, uh, right close to where the YMCA is. And for years we were at one spot there, then they put a road to the middle of it. So then they moved us back for where the ha airport hangars are and then they put more hangers up, so then they rearranged and put us. So we'd been there with great visibility. Everybody going back and forth to Daytona would drive right past it. Highway 92 at the airport grounds. Everyone knew where it was. And you could see from the roadway, you could see oh, the yeah. animals? See the animals, see the tent, and uh, so on. Yeah, it was, it was a big big deal. The people who sell us our diesel fuel, uh, we go through diesel, even if we're not traveling, we still have to have diesel fuel for the generators. And so that was a, a good steadier, steady winter gig for them coming over and de 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 delivering the diesel and the propane for the individual performers in their trailers, the cookhouse. Uh, you gotta make the popcorn pop somehow, and the hot dog's hot, you need propane for it, and so that would get delivered on a regular basis. And there are a lot of smaller, someone come and pump the toilets. There's stuff like that that most people don't even consider that was collateral income for the community. So when it closed in 2013, what was the impact? What was the reaction. I think a lot of people didn't realize that the circus wasn't was closed until the following year when they realized that hey the circus isn't coming this year because they, they would we would distribute free kids tickets through the school and our local sponsor uh, the local sponsor at the time used the circus money that paid for the Christmas parade. Wow. And so they were running around trying to figure out what they're gonna to do to pay for the Christmas parade. So somebody else took over sponsoring that. So it was pretty integrated into the community. Oh, then, it was. Economically and then sponsoring yeah. the Christmas parade. Oh yeah. So And in most of the communities that we traveled to, uh, we had a local sponsor. It was much easier to get the free kids tickets distributed in the schools if you had a local sponsor. If it's just the circus is coming, here's free kids tickets. The circus wasn't so, and the school board wasn't so anxious to distribute them. But if this is the circus sponsored by the Red Cross or the Kiwanis or Rotary or somebody like that, oh yeah, we want to support them. And so they got the tickets out to everybody. And that was part of your job as marketing. Yeah. yeah. Plus I would set up any advertising and publicity and things like that. I was able to organize two Regis and Kathy Lee interviews with our human cannonball. That was a chore taking the cannon from uh, Queens, driving it through New York City over to Central Park. but. It worked, and we did that show with them two different, two different occasions. And we would always try to generate as much local publicity as we could. You we did different things. We've had elephant races where we get celebrity people from the TV and the uh, news to be jockeys in the elephant. I remember we were at one place uh, and they had the new news guy, and the elephants then the race, they would all 
rear up on there with them hold we tell them to hold on and somebody didn't turn somebody's microphone and you heard it real loud oh shit right in the middle but we do that and we would do i mean when we were in new york i had elephant races we had then mayor giuliani we had people from the the tv and so on and of course if you have the the news desk people from channel two channel four channel six that means you're going to be on the six o'clock news and probably the 11 as well for each of them and so you know that that worked out well with quarter page pictures in the new york times and the new york post even here the deland beacon's always been very supportive of the circus and so they would do a nice story come out and take pictures uh in advance of the circus sheet marshall would come out to winter quarters and take pictures and so there would be nice stuff and that helped to remind people that the circus is coming in two weeks do you have any of those artifacts from that period still i don't think i saved them unfortunately there's a there's a lot of history in the world that it isn't important at the time now i'm cleaning out the attic let's throw that stuff away not realizing that what you're throwing away from your attic might be worth lots of money to somebody or valuable just from a historical standpoint so do you think there's there've been a general demise of circuses in in this country yeah i think so i mean ringing brothers ceased operation completely and they're getting ready to put out a new show i think next year uh, or maybe later this year and they've already said there'll be no animals no clowns and no ringmaster and a lot of the circus fans and circus people who like circus said that they're not going to have an audience either what about because this? people people want to see the animals they want to see clowns and you go to the circus so that you can just lose yourself and forget about your problem with your boss or your car that isn't working right or something you just kind of lose yourself for a couple hours um is were there any um uh, going to wrap up about the circus and move on to other things but before we do that are there any anecdotes about people falling off elephants or things that uh, you remember that well the things i remember is some of the people coming to the circus i and and how do you answer that i figured out a way uh, someone's there with their ticket in their hand excuse me what time does the 4:30 show start and i said well here we are at this nice mall and you got a movie theater so some of the performers wanted to go to the movie tonight after the show so we're going to do the 7:30 show at 4:30 and the 4:30 show at 7:30 so they can be finished early enough to go to the movie okay thank you very much they got an answer and they were happy with it another time we were in north carolina this couple came up older couple and they said excuse me send you work for the show yes sir i do my wife and i have been having a discussion the three girls that are hanging by their hair my wife says they're not really hanging by their hair they're wearing a wig is that right or not i said well actually you're, you're both wrong i said these three girls when they're little their parents decide this is what they're going to do so they've actually got a metal plate in their head and there's a bolt that goes on the man says i knew there was a trick so you know it's, it's i mean when i worked for the cruise line same thing people would come up and say you can get mostly older people or mostly younger people oh we get about half singles and half couples oh okay thank you or they'd say do you get mostly couples or mostly singles oh we get about half older people and half younger people okay thank you they got an answer and i'm always amazed at some of the things that that people uh that people say we were i had one of our advanced clowns we were in uh, bristol tennessee and they were doing the the weather and the weatherman said oh 
can you stand here with me while I'm doing the weather? I said, yeah, fine. And this clown had yellow hair. And the TV stations use something called a chroma key so that it sort of blocks things out. And suddenly the clown looked up at the monitor and it looked like he had no head. He said, look, I've become an airhead. Maybe I can get a job here as an anchor. They lost it. The, the, they fell out completely. That was the end of the six o'clock news. And stuff happens. And, you, and the same clown, another time, he had blue pants, blue shoes, and a, a blue, blue coat on. And they used blue for the chroma key instead of green. Most of them used the green screen. And so all you saw was the weatherman and the clown. You saw a head and a belt, and it, it just it disappeared. And uh, you know, things like that happen. Were you, as a young person, uh, struck by the circus? Is it, were oh, you yeah. always interested? I'd been going to see my parents used to always take me to see the Shrine Circus in Detroit on my birthday, which was always like the last weekend. January, first week in February. So I remember when the Wallendas came all falling down, it was on my birthday and we were all at the Shrine Circus and them falling down. But my parents always made sure that I got to the circus every year. And I belonged to some of the circus fan organizations or tried to join them even at a young age. I think somebody said, well, what, what's your favorite movie? What movie have you seen more than once? And I said, oh, The Greatest Show on Earth. I've seen it over and over and over. I can just about recite the dialogue with the, with the movie. It's, it's, it's an indelible thing. And it changes and, you know, it's, it's close. And that makes a difference. It's real. And we used to find that our attendance was better in an Olympic year because people are seeing athletes doing things and they realize that what they're watching is real people doing real things. It's not like going to a movie and it's all character generated with a computer, that these people really are hanging by their hair. They really are flying from one trapeze to another. They really are doing these things. And there's that sense of, of wonder. And they get a chance to ride an elephant uh, and that's an ex uh, something that isn't going to happen. Unfortunately, uh, seeing an elephant in person makes more of an impact on a child than them seeing it on a screen this big. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I, I want to touch on, too, are the um, human cannonballs. You said there were four still There's living in the Deland area. Four of them still area. living in the Deland area that just sort of settled here. They've got homes and uh, families and everything else. One works at the Humane Society and uh, she's from Ukraine. We have one that's from Romania that works at the Holiday Inn. We've got two from Bulgaria. One of them works at the, at the church and the other one is a hairstylist. So they settled here then? They settled here. And I mean there's other people in Orange City, the city just south of here, there's a number of circus people that have settled there. And uh, yeah, it's, they, they get used to it in the winter. They're here and say, you know, this is not a bad place. And they find a place, a house to rent, and then maybe buy one and stay here. So our community grows. And then when the circus does come, or any circus is close, all these people are coming to visit their friends and things. Uh -huh. The Cirque du Soleil has a permanent uh, tent or whatever yeah, in, building, in Orlando, yeah. correct? So that aspect of circus has stayed with the trapeze artists and Yeah, aerial. we've got uh, somebody that was uh, with his family on the trapeze at our show is working there. And uh, I know Bello, he's worked at our show and he's, he's put part of their show together with things. And uh, yeah, there's, there are a lot of former circus people working in, in the various theme parks in Orlando too. I have two Russian friends that in the winter, they used to stay with their children at my house. 
and they both work now at the uh, convention center in Orlando. If you're having a convention and you have anything that needs to be hung up, drapes, props, signs, stuff, they're doing it. They're doing all the high stuff. Yuri complains because he says, I haven't had a day off in a month and a half. But it's busy and he's well paid and he and his wife both work there. They're doing all the high rigging. I have other people that are circus friends. They're working for one of the billboard companies because they can climb up on the air and do stuff real quick because being up in the air doesn't bother them. Um, so you, prior to this, worked for Windjammer and, and you traveled the Caribbean, mm -hmm. I understand. I did. And I liked, I loved the Caribbean, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, people ask me, what are some of your favorite memories of your life? And I probably have more positive memories of the Caribbean and the ships than I do of the circus. That's just the way it is for me. Uh, it's more relaxing. The cities get increasingly busy with people, with traffic, with telephone noises, with everything else, where the Caribbean, most of it is still pretty laid back. Say, well, you're late. Yeah, I'm working on Caribbean. I'm working on island time. <laughs> what has been your involvement with the Deland Pride? I, I try to support them in their activities as much as I can. I make sure that they get a donation every, every month. I think it's worth supporting. And it's something that hasn't been recognized in a lot of communities for quite a while. Uh, they have their float and people cheering when they come in the Christmas parade now. And that makes me feel good and I think it makes everybody else feel good. And they have their uh, Love is Love, their festival every year. And they get people and people come in and they're bringing their kids. And I think people are figuring out slowly that gay people are your neighbor down the street just as much as a black person or a white person or that they're all people. So you've seen a real shift since uh, I have, yeah, 1984. I have. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I have. It's, it's, it's changed. People are more accepting and you read here and there or see on the news where somebody got beat up because of this or that but it doesn't seem to happen around here. Thankfully, uh, people are a little more open-minded. Do you think- And I think it's because they're slowly being educated and a lot of it is self-education, but it, it, I don't think people avoid going to someplace because it's gay owned or gay staffed or gay operated. I don't think that's a barrier so much anymore. Recently, there was a, a, uh, a fundraising event which uh, circa, uh, focused on drag queens, and people were invited to come and dress up, and apparently it was a great success. It was huge. They called it uh, a turnabout follies or some, a turnabout show, and they had people from the community involved, and they brought all their friends that they work with from the supervisor of elections office and some of the stores and businesses, the uh, editor and publisher of the newspaper and her husband, people like, and it was fun, everybody came in. Yeah, they, I think they made like $10,000. That's what I heard. Yeah, and uh, people, people will fund things if they understand it. That's key. Yeah that they know it's not something as, you know, you're gay, I'm not, oh, because I shake your hand or I'm reduce you, it's not gonna rub off, I'm not, it's not like I'm catching COVID from you or something. That's certainly more dangerous. When, when I came to, to the land, if you wanted any kind of gay association or anything, you had to either go to Orlando or to Daytona. At the time then, there were three or four bars. You could go there and uh, 
not anymore. They're not there. There's still places in in Orlando, but I don't think in Daytona, not any organized like they were. Of course, there was the infamous incident in Orlando at the, at Pulse, the gay yeah. at Pulse. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the idea of a, a drag show uh, in Deland. Well, what's going to happen with that? So they had it at Da Vinci, which uh, Cafe Da Vinci had, had a reputation as where you get the rock bands and the music and stuff like that, the college crowd. And they had it on a Tuesday night, and they've been going for two years now, with no incidents to speak of. And uh, it's it's a fun thing. The Stetson kids come over in big groups, but I, I have a feeling that there are more people that are out of the closet, or they're just exploring their own sexuality and will come just because it's fun and they come in groups. They're not one or two people coming individually. Mm -hmm. They're coming as a, a class trip. So what else would you like for us to know about um, the gay community here or whatever? I, I think that there is a lot of support there are a lot of businesses, more and more of them, that are getting involved in supporting things because they're realizing that, you know, people don't wear a sign around their neck saying, I'm gay, help me. Uh, they don't know. And so if I have a business and I put money into something that the gay community is offering, uh, I don't know how much of that's going to end up in my pocket because I'm supporting it. But I think people are realizing that there is more gay people in the world, whether they advertise it or not. Well, as Harvey Milk said, if everyone who was gay outed themselves, the whole thing would be done with. Yeah. Because yeah. there are so many people. Um, in that group. There were people in, in Venice, Florida, where Ringling Brothers had their winter quarters uh, that used to complain about the circus. So one year, one, one week, they paid everybody in the circus in cash with $2 bills. And the public was overwhelmed seeing $2 bills everywhere. They, they, that just, it, it, just really blew their mind. They, they didn't realize what an impact it is. Because, you that know, was an interesting way of making that you know, they This was quite a few years ago, but there were people who were complaining, and they finally decided, wait a minute. Um, based on your own experience, what advice would you give to a young person today, gay or straight, or in between? Uh, I would try and become friends, find an older person, a mentor maybe, or whatever, and really listen to what they have to say because sometimes they're going to save a younger person aggravation or not. I mean, I was amazed as I got older how much smarter my parents got. At least it seemed that way to me. It just, you know, that, gee, you know what they told me? makes sense now and you know that a lot of times older people aren't talking just to hear their gums rattle they really have something to to say did you ever come out to your parents oh yeah and what was their reaction oh okay moving right along did you find a new car you want to buy yet you know it was it's just like yeah you're not telling us anything we didn't know so mothers know. Mothers are pretty intuitive, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so how would you like to be remembered? I don't know. I, I, I would guess I'd like to be remembered as uh, someone who enjoyed life and uh, would pass that on to everybody else. Uh, 
live your life the way you want it to be. Uh, I have a, a painting on my wall that Don Nedebeck, a local artist here, that he used to do a lot of animal pictures and things. And it said something, I'm just me. It has a cat that says, I'm just me. I'm a lot like other cats, but deep down, I'm just me. And you gotta be yourself. And it was a, who was it said, uh, tr trust yourself, be yourself. Every heart vibrates to that iron string. I've forgotten who the author was now, but that uh, said that you, you've got to be who you are, be who you want to be, be where you want to be. And sometimes, you know, that for money, for one other reason or another, you can't always be where you want to be, but you need to do it. My dad always told me, you know, he says, I think if you want to enjoy your life, you figure out what you want to do, and then figure out where you get paid for doing it. You did that? Yeah, I did. I have, I have no regrets. Of my, I mean, I have two degrees in education, but I haven't taught school for years. And I worked for the cruise line, when got a chance between the cruise line and the circus to be in all but about six of the states and travel around the Caribbean and around the part of the world, and I enjoy myself. <laughs>